And now we're going to talk about something which is so central to Solutions House, which is storytelling, public engagement, and the magic side of climate. We talk a lot about the logic of climate, around the science and the targets and the goals and the technology and this giant architecture of change. But the magic of sustainability, the human truths, the comedy, the, 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 the messages, the storytelling, I believe, are are 50%, exactly half as important as the actual infrastructure. And that makes you important. And it makes everybody who is watching online, engaging with this session around the world, important as well. So it's my very, very great pleasure to now hand over to Kate Brandt, the Chief Sustainability Officer at Google, and also, if I may say, both the sustainability and style icon of mine. <laughs> Kate, please come on up. Woo! Thank you so much. I'll be sitting. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Soli, and so great to be here again for another wonderful conversation on the Solutions House stage. So I'm going to welcome up our fantastic creators so we can get this going. Come on up, guys. to meet you. Nice to meet you. All right. So I'm so excited that you guys are here. Thank you for making the trip to New York. Um, I was just saying to Soli before we came on stage, this is the session, whether it's during Climate Week or during COP, that I look forward to the most because I think what you all are doing is so fantastic. So excited to dive in. Excited to disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> So we were talking in our last session about the huge role that culture and specifically YouTube creators play in illuminating solutions around climate change. We've been talking a lot about some really great research that has recently come out, and I'm going to quote a couple of studies that I thought were really interesting around the role of solutions in inspiring action. So 70% of youth are encouraged when they are made aware of innovations in sustainability technology, viewing them as crucial for effective climate action. And then the other stat that I found really interesting is research shows that awareness of climate solutions boosts optimism with significant improvement in outlook. So, all right, we're here to talk about solutions. We're on the Solutions House stage. And of course, we also want to acknowledge the big challenges that we face. So I'm so honored to be here with you all. We're all taking a very different perspective on that. And uh, before we dive in, I just want to give you all the chance to introduce yourselves. So why don't we start? Bar yeah. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. I know everyone is really busy and probably exhausted from all the Climate Week events. My name is Leah Yu. I'm a beauty influencer content creator that started on the platform on YouTube, then built my beauty brand or skincare brand called Crave Beauty with a K. And our brand is all about slowing down the fast fashion like beauty industry. And I just quickly noticed that the overwhelming amount of products are not only overwhelming our skin, but it's also overwhelming the, pl the planet and all the stakeholders involved. So I'm trying to play my part in doing um, good. And I hope everyone here acknowledges all the fast, you know, paced and wasteful nature of the consumer industry and take a small part in changing that. Hey everybody, good morning. I am Prajikta Kori. I'm from Mumbai, India. And um, I've been a YouTube creator for almost 10 years now. I started off with making uh, comedy con. I started off with making comedy content and uh, about two years ago I moved to, uh, like I started leaning a little more on social impact. I uh, started work on um, gender equality and body positivity in girls education and very recently I've been speaking about climate action as well. I uh, work as UNDP India's youth climate champion and I'm very grateful that I get to be a creator in this time and age where there are partners looking for collaborations with creators like me and I'm always very, very grateful to YouTube for putting me on platforms like this. But yeah, uh, my role in the whole climate fight is to kind of take content, break it down into bite-sized pieces and then disseminate it into my audience which is between the ages of 16 to 28. So as easy as it can be, simplified storytelling, conversations, that's where I come in and yeah. Please like and subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Fisayo Fosudo. I'm from Nigeria. This is my first time in the US, so I'm really happy to be Yay. here. Yay. All right. And, yeah, 
I, I have a pretty interesting story because um, I didn't think I would be here. I'm here on behalf of the State Department of the US, which is weird to say. <laughs> um, I've been learning so much in the past week about the climate, the environment, and for, in Nigeria, it's only 60% of people have access to electricity. Mm -hmm. Effectively, 40 million people do not have access to electricity, and this is so weird. We have the sun in abundance, and these people don't have access to this thing. I'm just so inspired to have this opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm a creator who makes videos around technology, finance. I occasionally interview business leaders and creative people. Early in the year, we spoke to the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, and that became something huge where people are asking us to do more. I've been helping people renovate homes. I've built a house for someone, and we renovated a school where we added solar panels um, that gives them energy and helps pump water. So I'm really looking forward to do more. Thank you for having me here. Hi, everyone. My name is Simone. I am from Stockholm, Sweden, but I live in Los Angeles. And uh, my career has always been led by my core values, which are humility and integrity. And what that means is that I've uh, mostly built shitty robots. <laughs> So if you've ever seen um, somebody get woken up by an alarm clock that slaps them in the face with a rubber hand, that was most likely me. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I mean, I make videos about things that I build, and I try to communicate a joy about building things. I haven't focused that much on the climate, but I also think Something that's really interesting and important is having people who are not afraid to try new things. And I see that as one of the main works that I do. Um, so yeah, I do a lot of product design now because as I've gotten older, I've gotten more boring. <coughs> and also I like realized I didn't want robot throwing, robots throwing food in my face anymore. So I started a product business where I uh, try to reimagine everyday objects and think of how I can add functionality to them or how I can get them to serve me better. So just thinking of the world around us is very malleable because everything we have, somebody just came up with it. So like I can be a person who gets to come up with those things. So that's kind of the guiding star of it. Fabulous. All right, good. Well, before we dive into our conversation, yes, absolutely, round of applause. <laughs> Before we dive into our conversation, we just wanted to give everyone in the audience and online a little bit of a flavor for your work. So we're going to roll a few short clips and then we'll dive in. Mm -hmm. I'm a visual storyteller, and on my channel, you'll find videos about the latest technology from smartphones, VR headsets, and everything in between. And I also interview leaders in state and business, as well as creative people. I'm also committed to changing lives, and with my partnerships, we've been able to rebuild four homes and a school. Join me on my eponymous channel, Fisai for Sudo, and let's learn and grow together. So without further ado, I'll see you on the channel. We all know as a YouTuber, actor, a very well-known content creator, India's first United Nations Development Program Youth Climate Champion, Prajakta Kohli. What's up? Thank you so much for watching Mostly Say and I'm Tarik Now. We're going to talk about biodiversity, we're going to talk about a sustainable ecotourism. I'm a 
skincare content creator with over a million people tuning in, but also an accidental entrepreneur who founded Crave Beauty. I've helped countless of people transform their skin and really clear their skin in the most healthiest way possible. I know firsthand what it feels like to struggle with acne, inflammation, and constantly sensitized skin. But what truly helped my skin was pressing reset. That's why at Crave Beauty, we're interested in doing things low, saying no to the fast beauty cycle and the fast product launch cycle, and also expanding on our commitment to ethical and sustainable sourcing. Whether you're here for skincare or discovering more sustainable lifestyle, or just my journey of building Crave Beauty, I'm so glad that you're here. Let's press reset together. All right, amazing. I'm excited to dive in with you guys. So Projecta, it's so great to see you again. Oh. Thank you for being back with us. Well, thank you for having me. That's so great. All right, so we got a little flavor for your content in that short clip that we got to see, but I think what I have always really appreciated about your work is that you do a lot of great storytelling and you make a lot of these issues feel really relatable and you go into communities and you really talk to people about what's happening. So tell me a little bit more about like how you're approaching your work right now, what's working, what lessons have you learned, just tell us kind of what you're excited about right now. So I started making YouTube videos in 2015, right? So I've always been a huge fan of long form content. So when the whole short form wave came, I was like, nope, not going there, not interesting. <laughs> But that's not happening anymore, so I'm making short form content. <laughs> so I think what really works is kind of constantly evolving. I don't think there's a way to really settle as a creator. And I like that about it, that there's no monotony. Uh, you're constantly learning, you're growing up with your audience. So as we speak, there are things I learn every single day. This is my fifth year at Climate Week. And even today, I was at a, at, a, at a round table earlier this morning and I'm still learning about solutions, I'm still learning about innovations, I'm still learning about tech that's working for us, I'm still learning about stories that are working from us, uh, for us. So I think what really works is not kind of ever reaching a point of saying, okay, now I know this, mm -hmm. now this is what I do. Yeah. This is how I'm gonna sell my content and this is what I'm gonna say. Uh, I think as, as long as you're speaking to your audience and not at them, I think you're fine because uh, I feel very fortunate that a huge chunk of my audience is between the age of 16 to 28, like I said, and they're all very aware. They mm -hmm. all want to be a part of the conversation. They care about it, and they are the most um, prone to information generation that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, so if there was ever a good time to talk about pressing issues, especially like climate, it's now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Fasayo, it's so nice to meet you, and I really appreciated where you were already starting to get into some of your perspective, but I know as we saw in your video, you, know, you cover a lot of issues around technology, but also really related to the community, and, and it was so interesting to hear what you were talking about, energy access. So I'd love to hear from you both, you know, through your work, but also what's been inspiring you this week. Yeah, um, like I said, uh, this past week, I, I spoke with a bunch of people, uh, firstly from the State Department, I spoke with people from Cloudflare, spoke with professors, universities, mm -hmm. um, went to NASA, interesting. Cool. <laughs> and yeah, just speaking on like ethics and AI and things like that, and also how people are you know, using recycling mattresses, changing it into other forms of you know, materials. People are using plants to create wallets, shoes, clothes. All of these things, I'm just so inspired by them. But I think as a creator, what I'm mostly excited about is I have the opportunity to now speak with leaders, with people who are able to make change possible. And honestly, my goal is take everything I've learned and speak to the people that you know, can actually make change, people that can actually do something, or even let the conversation be known. Because something else I recently learned is people may not necessarily know about these things. Like, these things exist, these problems exist in the world, but many people don't know. Many people are experiencing this problem, uh, this problem but they don't necessarily even know what the problem is. And I feel with the right storytelling, with um, the right platform and the right knowledge, which I feel like I'm, again, learning so much, I'm definitely going to like, be able to speak with people and help them understand all of these things, so. Yeah. Absolutely, it's fantastic. Leah, it's also so great to meet you. 
Um, I loved learning more about the work that you're doing. I am very committed to sustainable beauty myself, so I can't wait to try your products. <laughs> um, and I'd love to hear more from you, you know, in this conversation around sustainable beauty, sustainable consumption. You're an entrepreneur, you're doing this as a business owner, and you're talking about it as a creator. Tell me like how you're approaching the intersection between these two aspects of your work. Yeah, it's definitely not easy. I think um, I get comments in on my YouTube video saying like, oh, like why is a beauty creator talking about sustainability or climate change? Like you're not going to change the world, girl. Like, but if I can change and help empower one person who's viewing my video to shop or like to buy less or buy slow or buy better and you know better sustainable alternatives to what they're originally buying anyway. I think that's um, that's what I'm here to do. And when it comes to skincare, I'm sure everyone here uses sunscreen, I hope. Um, I think there's a lot of consumerism in the beauty industry that sells on our insecurity. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a beauty ideal, there's a beauty standard, there's like an aspirational image that we are all trying to achieve through buying more products. And that's the messaging and the narrative the beauty industry, and quite honestly, a lot of the product industry has been instilling in us as consumers. Like we feel like we need to buy, 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 and apply more and more and more in order to have the perfect glass skin, in order to feel like we're not gonna age and we're gonna be immortal. So I think this is a conversation that I really was passionate about changing. And it started on YouTube about like, how do I make people go from a maximalist skincare routine or applying a maximalist skincare routine into really learning more about their skin and how amazing their skin naturally is and empowering empowering the conversation of like, let's listen to your, what your skin is saying because less is actually more when you learn about how amazing your skin is because it's no, it knows already how to repair, rejuvenate, regulate on its own and the products are there to support the natural, natural skin's functionality, not to overtake it. So I think once you have that kind of mindset shift, you're, you're, you can quickly realize that a lot of the marketing or in the beauty messaging out there are trying to basically you know, create more unnecessary demands to sell more products. And my job is to really help um, our audience, my audience, and our customers, and our community to help shop better and I know at the end of the day you know we can talk about zero waste lifestyle and I think that's a very ideal lifestyle to live if you're really really into sustainability but it's not attainable to the mass scale so how do I shift the mass consumer to shop more sustainably and therefore change how these companies operate in releasing products how can the product be more sustainable how can they listen to their stakeholders in the sourcing process how can they work with more farmers to come up with better Better solutions to be integrated into the product formula and I think those are the conversations I'm interested in you know adding more value into and I'm glad that now is a time that everyone is you know realizing shit like there are so many products like once you walk into these beauty retailers like you're bombarded and overwhelmed and I think people feel the urgency and I think the beauty industry now hopefully is seeing that to really change into more of a slow paced you know building something that's more timeless rather than this trend driven products so yeah no absolutely <clears throat> so Simone I, I really appreciate the way that you use humor in a lot of your work and also just really the focus on solutions which we've been talking about a lot today being here at Solutions House and I know you mentioned you're you know just sort of starting to explore the connection between a lot of the work you do on science and engineering thinking about the connection to climate tell me how you're thinking about that in your work right now I mean, I've, I've always prided my work in being thoroughly uneducational. <laughs> like, there are a lot of amazing educators on YouTube, but it's like I learned how to build things on YouTube. It's never going to be a tutorial. I'm not an expert, but what I am is somebody who can show you how you can think about things differently. And, you know, the amount of climate dread I felt at this event and the world is just coming down hard and all the horrible things happening in Gaza and there's factory farming and there's plastics everywhere. And yesterday I was just so sad about everything. And I made the mistake of calling my older brother and he was like, yeah, shit's awful. And uh, you're, you're trying to like, yeah, figure out what is your role here. And I really think for me, it's like, 
just conveying a curiosity about the world around us. Because I think one of the things that I, I, I really wish that the climate movement kind of focused on, or that I saw, or like a, an approach that really appeals to me is like, I feel like there's a lot of shame and a lot of shaming happening where it's like, you should try harder, you should do better. And it's almost scary for me as a public person to talk about oh, I want to do better in terms of climate because that puts a target on your back and then people are going to be like, okay, but you went on an airplane. So um, what I wish is that doing the right thing was the easiest option and that we had cities and societies that kind of guided us to do the right thing. But like if we're talking about waste, for example, like it's so inconvenient to try to go with a zero waste lifestyle and it's just like how can we design our society so that we help people make that option because now doing the right thing is at a huge sacrifice for the individual. Um, I mean, something that's great about having been on YouTube for 10 years is that now I have people come up to me and say, I watched you in middle school and I'm in engineering now because of you, which A, makes me feel really old, uh, but B, <laughs> also makes me feel incredibly proud because we do need more engineers. We need more people who understand the environment around us and how we can make it work better for to, to help with our common goal of a more sustainable planet. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I'm gonna ask the, this question of all of you all. So you're all storytellers. You've all been you know, sharing a little bit about what you've been seeing at Climate Week, both the things that can be you know, really hard, really depressing, but also the things that have been inspiring. Is there one story that you're planning to leave New York and you know that you wanna tell? Maybe Projecto, we can start with you. Wow, oh. May I take a minute to think? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. I'm happy for anyone to begin who has, a, has something in their mind. Sorry. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I, I can also ask you a different question if you guys want to think about that one. I can. Um, yeah, please, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and this is, for one, putting a fucking target on your back. Let's talk about veganism. Um, I think if there was one thing I want to take with me and that I wish, if there was one piece of behavior that I uh, wish I could uh, encourage people to do is just to cut down on the amount of meat you need if you are able to. I know that not a lot of people or some people are not able to, but it's like it's one of the easiest things you can do and it's like good for the environment, good for your body. So, yeah. Vegetables. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. One person in the back. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, when I used to speak about climate action to my viewers, I used to always tell them, that don't wait for the policy makers, don't wait for the government, <laughs> don't wait, wait for the bigger like companies to make these things. You know, you should start small and you have a role to play and every voice counts and you have to do this. But this time at Climate Week, I realized that yes, that's true, but I think of all the things, I mean, yes, the policy makers, yes, the governments, yes, the bigger corporations, but also marketing plays such a huge role. And that brings us back to storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, when I was flying to the US, um, my mom being my mom kind of put it on our family WhatsApp group that I'm going to go to the US. And the number of cousins who are young, 16, 17, younger, have messaged saying, can you get me a Stanley cup? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to have to pack a different suitcase only so I can get that many Stanley Cups. But when you really look about, look at it, if this was marketed as a, you know, climate conscious solution that say no to plastic, don't use single use plastics and spend like five times as much money on a cup, mm -hmm. I don't know if we would accept it as easily, but it became a trend on Instagram. <laughs> and uh, it looks cool and everybody you follow uses it and I think that those routes of uh, communication around issues that are generally communicated with a lot more complexities are so important mm -hmm. so that's something that I really want to work with my brand collaborators back when I go home I mean I have the pleasure of working with some 
lovely, lovely brands. Um, and that's something I've learned this time that I'm taking back with me for sure. But I want to sit on solutions with them where I can see how existing products can be sold in a way where you don't sensationalize the issue of climate consciousness, but right. normalize it. Absolutely. Well, and actually, Leah, I'd love to hear your perspective on this because we, we think about this a lot too because at Google, we're an information company. We track Google Trends. We see what's working for people. And what we often find is it's good to talk about the co-benefits. You know, yeah. we've done things like fuel-efficient routing in Google Maps. We first and foremost talk about that as like, you can save money on your fuel, and then by the way, you're also going to reduce your emissions, but that you can reach a broader audience if you can really capitalize on talking about the co-benefits, like the example you gave. But Leah, how are you thinking about that in your work? I imagine that comes up for you a lot. Yeah, I think um, by slowing down your product launch cycle doesn't mean that you're not going to grow. And I think there's a mindset in all consumer product company, especially with a lot of VCs coming in to really groom the product and force the brand to grow at like 500% year over year to sell to a bigger conglomerate. I think that's really damaging the entire ecosystem and it's really deprioritizing the stakeholders and the end consumers who's receiving the product. So when I say um, we still need to grow, but we want to slow down our uh, product launch cycle, it's really about selling one product to 100 people instead of selling 100 product to one person. Mm -hmm. And there's an, there's an idea where we need like 100 products in order to have a healthy, useful looking skin, but it's truly not. And you can grow like how Vaseline grew. Vaseline became like a household staple to most American households and they're huge and they're very influential, but they started with that like a tub of petroleum jelly. So I think consumers definitely have the absolute power to change this narrative. And, you know, Fifty Shades of Foundation was not a norm until the consumers said something about it. Like, we feel excluded, like there's not a shade for us. I think the beauty companies, you know, they, they survive with the conversation of consumers and the feedback from consumers. And I think that will really challenge a lot of beauty companies and a lot of fashion brands to think about how do we launch products more ethically, sustainably, intentionally, that actually build something that's far more evergreen and far more timeless and grow with the customers. And I think there's a notion where within the product industry, a lot of the businesses are built to sell. And I think that's a really harmful mindset to a lot of stakeholders involved because then you're not, you're basically running this company in, with the notion that you'll sell this company at a $500 million you know, paycheck one day to a bigger conglomerate. And I think that comes with a lot of implications and neglection and ignorance of the stakeholders involved. So I would love to see more business founders, entrepreneurs, you know, a lot of content creators who are turning into entrepreneurs to really be tapped into how do we change the consumer behavior, therefore challenge the industry to you know, make, make a bigger splash in the ecosystem. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, Pasaya, you were sharing with us a little bit about some of the great conversations you've had this week, NASA, looking at AI. Um, you know, tell us, like, what, what stories are you going to tell when you get back home? Yeah, I think for me it's two stories. The first is, and this is a bit of a mixed bag, is renewable energy. Nigeria is a heavily dependent country on petrol. Yeah. Um, and right now it is very scarce. There's queues. I've personally been on a queue for over two hours just to get fuel. Um, but other than that, um, like I said in the beginning, there's only 61, around about 61% of people that have access to electricity. This leaves 40 million people without electricity. And like I said, the sun is in abundance, but solar is also very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. I, th I think I started doing something with a brand and started you know, trying to push like, okay, everybody should use solar. But I think a conversation I would love to have is again with leaders, with storytelling, let there be a way where we can you know, have this be a little bit more affordable or just accessible at least. And the next thing for me is waste. Um, I was fortunate to meet with um, some people from the Earthshot Prize and this was just an amazing experience because people are, like I said, people are taking plants and converting it into wallets, into shoes and into 
clothing. It's in H&M, it's in BMW cars, and I just wish this type of innovation comes to us because what we have now, um, the, the, the things we have now, the products we have now are things that are sourced from our planet and are not, like they are not unlimited, but all the other things are limited. The plants grow again. Yeah. They come from the soil. And when they use those resources to make things that we can actually wear and they look stylish, I think that we can, you know, that is very sustainable. And I'm looking forward to tell those two stories. We're going to produce videos on those, at least one of them this week and in the coming weeks. So I'm really, really excited about that. Amazing. Oh, great. And we would love to talk with you more about carbon-free energy, the role in the just energy transition. That's something that we're doing a lot of listening and learning about right now, so we really need to follow up with yeah. you on that. Okay, well, we're going to close out with one lightning round question, but before we do, we have a wonderful audience here in the room with us and also some folks online. So first, I'd love to open it up and see if anyone in the room has any questions for our creators. We have someone in the back here, and I think we have some mics. There we go. Yes. Hi, my name is Anvita and I'm here from India and my question is to you, Prajakta. Hi. Hi. First of all, I'm asking this question despite that uh, climate change is a global issue. YouTube is a global platform, but I understand creators, YouTube creators have their own niche audience. And I understand that your audience majority is from India or let's say South Asia. So have you seen any difference in the conversations about climate change in India and here in the, let's say, the Western countries or Western part of the world? Do you see any difference? And the second question would be, as YouTube creators with so much of influence, what do you think is, what role can you play to bridge that gap if there is any difference in the conversations? Thank you. I, didn't, I didn't get your name, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Anvita. Anvita? Hi. Um, unfortunately, I've not really had a, um, a chance to kind of interact with any of the audience here. I mean, all my conversations, uh, all my engagement actually happens on my socials. And you're right, a huge chunk of that comes from India, from Pakistan, from Nepal. Um, so I've not really had uh, an idea of it because most times when in rooms like this, conversations kind of have, like I'm, I'm really hoping that after the session I can talk to you about it and kind of learn more about it. Um, also, I'm still growing. I mean, the economy in India, uh, it's, it's, uh, India is the biggest digital economy in the world, but we are still growing. There are a lot of creators. Our reach is really more inward than it is outward at this point. We're trying to go more direct because uh, internet is very easily accessible in most parts of my country, in the smallest of towns, smallest of villages. So we're really trying to go um, deeper, um, into regions in our country more than we are looking at kind of opening up to the world. But I would love to learn about this from you and then, and then I might have an answer. <laughs> Great. Thank I you. think that we have um, a question from online that's always yes. going to read us. Yes. Analog way for me to share some online questions. So I'm here and I'll join them here. We're getting a lot of energy online and a lot of questions from people who are creators themselves online asking for your advice. And a big piece of advice that have been asked of all four of the panelists is about online engage engagement. Basically, if you post about the scary, awful stuff around sustainability, does your engagement go down? And if you scare, if you post about the fun, positive solutions, does it go up? And and does that mean that we're not going to be talking about the hard stuff online and we can only talk about the uplifting stuff? Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, d d does engagement drive what we can talk about on, on sustainability online? I think there's some people worried that if they start posting about sustainability, their engagement is going to drop. Mm. Well, think about okay. that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, I think there is a little bit of exhaustion that is happening with, um, is creative the right word? The post, the, the, like the very photoshopped images of something um, with numbers and a pie diagram on it and like there's a graph and then okay. there'll be like a, you know, I don't even know what they're called, honestly. Huh? Infographic? Infographic. That's the one. Uh, I think there's definitely uh, a point of exhaustion that our audience, especially the younger ones, have hit with infographics. So let's not do that. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, let's let's instead really look at short form interactive content. I was speaking about this to um, these three young uh, change uh, climate action activists from uh, UNDP. Uh, at least, I, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong if this happens in America, but in India, a lot of times when there's conversations that are serious, like if it's about climate action, for example, if you lean on trends, that's like looked down upon. They're like, oh my god, like, are you taking this conversation for granted? Do you know the earth is dying? And I'm like, but the trends are working. You know, it's getting me the views, it's getting me the engagement, it's getting me the reach, it's getting me the numbers. If it's getting people to be a part of the conversation, no matter what way it happens, Let's not have this, these prejudices about the way you get this content through. And engagement is honestly the ruling uh, piece for all of them. So I think it's each creator to their own, but finding a balance of telling the facts uh, without, and I mean, obviously, toxic positivity is also like a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like every, like I get this uh, a lot where they're like, uh, yeah, but like, what more? You know, tell us about the things that are working. I said, yes, I will tell you about the things that are working, but this is why we need to know yeah. why the things that are working are important. So I think finding that balance in narrative helps. Uh, for my country, I think language has a huge role to play because we're a very, very diverse country. Every few kilometers, the language and the dialect changes. So which is why uh, finding create, create a, which comes back to Anvida, what uh, you asked, I think, which is why we keep going back to a more targeted reach with people because we know that Engagement really comes from the relatability now and not from numbers anymore. So I think just finding that helps. Yeah. I just want to add to it, like, what's so cool about the internet now and the creators on the internet is that it's like a petri dish. And like, if there's any place where it will be figured out how to talk about really grim things and in like an engaging way, it's gonna be on the internet. Yeah. So I think like somebody will come and they're like, okay, this is how we're gonna talk about wildfires, but we're gonna make it fun and interesting and engaging. So I feel like, yeah, you just, somebody will figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So which is why we got the wildfire yeah. dance for you. No, no just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I yeah. can add to that. I think there's a place for climate doomism that actually fuels people to, or like rage them up to act on something to closer to a solution. But I think there's a space for climate optimism online who would rather consume information that are more positive and they feel good about knowing, okay, my work is contributing to some progress. So I think when it comes to marrying climate content into your niche, um, I would take an example of like a food or a content or a food cooking YouTuber. If they can talk about the food waste issue, it's a number third uh, polluter and contributing factor to the climate change and the climate crisis that we're dealing with, but then they can also suggest a solution of let's you know mitigate food waste, let's buy from local farmers, let's actually start composting. If you can marry some sort of actionable solution to the problem that you're you know kind of like dropping facts on that can be scary, I think that could be a way to be a little bit more neutral or maybe move the negative and scary conversation to a more optimistic you know um, conversation. Yeah, I like what you're all saying about pairing the realism with the optimism and really focusing on the solution and getting specific, right? I think that's also what you're saying. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? No, yeah. I'm good. Right, good. All right, well, we probably have time for maybe one more question. Let's go to this young gentleman in the back here. My name is Robert, and I have a channel called Children's Climate Championship, where I interview kids, scientists, and organizations all around the world about how kids can help stop climate change. I have made over 200 videos over the past two years with really amazing speakers. Wow. Like Catherine Hayo. I only have around 700 followers, and I was asking how can I help my channel grow? What's your channel called? Children's Climate Championship. Children's Climate Championship? Yeah. And we are live, yes? Yeah. yeah. Please subscribe <laughs> to Children's Climate Championship. <laughs> Do it now. It's free and it's great. <laughs> Any other advice? But I think, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, this is good, this is good, this is good. Uh, the, fact, the fact that you, uh, you have created a lot of content, I think it, today, right. there is a need for content that is 
uh, coming back to what we were talking about, that is different from the way that climate action has been spoken about. So thank you so much for doing what you're doing. And keep putting that content out. It's going to get you the reach because people are getting more aware about it. And the only way you can do it is shameless plugging. Everywhere you go, ask people to follow you. I'm, I'm serious. Uh, as creators, we don't have marketing budgets. We don't have a team <laughs> sitting telling, you know, you're going to have these many billboards in the city. You're going to be on Times Square. That's not going to happen for us. So the only way is spam people, honestly. Just send your links out to everyone you can. Ask everyone in your family to do it. Every person you meet, you are in some of the most influential rooms this week. Everyone you meet, do that. And another thing I do is when I go to uh, technology stores, like if I'll go to an Apple store, most of them are logged into accounts. Subscribe to your channel from all the devices. <laughs> <laughs> Works very Love well. That. Each time. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. This is some great advice. And any, any other advice from the panel for our for our creators in the room and online? I think just keep on trying new things, and like you'll find something that will spread beyond your bubble that you're in. And um, yeah, just really try to tell the story in a very simple way. I think often we make it a little bit too complicated. And like for me, who builds stuff, I always think nobody's going to care that it also has Bluetooth. Like, what's the very easy story? Because people just want an easy story to latch on to. Yeah. All right, amazing. Great. All right, well, we are almost out of time. So we're going to close out here with one lightning round, which is just in a few words, we'll just go down the panel starting over here. Um, what's keeping you hopeful right now? What, what are, what, what's giving you some hope? I mean, kiddo in the back. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm really happy that um, creators have been included in this conversation. Um, uh, a lot of things I've been hearing, you know, is that like, Many creators haven't been like included in some of these things, uh, especially with like certain types of interviews, and especially from my region as well. Um, I spoke with two African um, people on the Earthshot Prize, one from Ghana, one from Kenya. Both of them are solving the waste problem, and um, you know it's just very inspiring to see that. We're able to use like global platforms like this to share the story, and I'm just really optimistic about you know the inclusion, mm -hmm. and also the fact that um, this is a positive message. This is a message that is going to help our environment. Um, I think we should do more. Just mm -hmm. keep telling that story. I'm just really really passionate, and also like I've learned so much, and I can't wait to share them. Thank Amazing. you. Amazing. Um, what's keeping me most hopeful is that um, this time, especially this year in New York, especially, I feel very optimistic about the fact that there's a lot more young people in places of decision making. Yeah. Mm. Uh, there's a lot more young um, decision makers, change makers. There, there are platforms dedicated only to highlight work that young people from across the globe are doing, and that's what makes me most hopeful. Love that, absolutely. What's keeping me hopeful is talking to you, Kate. Uh, I mean, are you kidding me? CSO of Google is actually giving us a platform to amplify our vo voices, and I think that's huge. It means so much. It means so much. Well, thank you all so much. I love this, really focusing on the locally relevant solutions, the voices of young people, and how we can partner, right? How we can utilize these platforms like YouTube to lift up these voices, lift up these solutions. Um, so it's been truly an honor to be here with you all. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you for all that you're doing. And I'm really excited to stay in touch and follow up on what you're doing. And of course, please follow our amazing yes. panelists on YouTube. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you.